When you play Chopin's Etude Opus 10 number 11, it's really important to make sure that you rotate through all of those big chords instead of trying to reach for them. And I'll show you at the keyboard a little bit about how to do that. Something else that can be helpful is to let yourself have a tiny bit of your hands closing in between each phrase. It's sort of like a singer taking a breath. And, you know, Chopin made all of his students sing, and he loved bel canto opera. Two of his favorite composers were Bellini and Donizetti. So I think that we can steal from traditions that we know Chopin loved that also make it easier for us to play. So you can have this moment where you might sometimes have just a little bit of a breath and it might bring the phrase to life a little bit and it might make it easier for your hand. You're also going to want to experiment with fingering. See whether it feels better to use two or three or sometimes four for the middle note. If you can do an octave with your thumb to your fourth finger, sometimes it can be really nice to do four to five, but if you need to just do five, five, five for the whole melody, that can absolutely work as long as you're really hearing each note go to each of the neck, each go to each next note melodically. You can also, and this is probably true whether you have small hands or any size hands, it's a good idea to start by just learning the melody by itself. So without all of the rolls and all of the difficulty, but just so that you're coming from this musical idea of this. So that then when you're re adding in all of this business, you have it in a context that makes musical sense to you. So I'll try to show you some places where I've found fingerings and some solutions that I hope will help you. You want to rotate through all these big expanses. Make sure you turn, don't stretch. Don't do it that way. Rotate. You've really got to let go of the right hand thumb and the left hand pinky. And sometimes closing part of the hand is the only way to get the rest of it to open. A position I call the one-eared llama is really helpful here. The one-eared llama is a hand position that might seem sort of strange but can actually be really, really useful and helpful. So if you imagine that your hand and your arm are a llama, here's two-eared llama, hello, with this being the body, and this being the neck, and this being the head, ears, nose, mouth. The distance between the ear and the nose is actually really far, and if you let your hand close, it can help you find the shape that you need. So just to really show you the difference between what's possible with a flat hand stretching and what's possible with a one-eared llama, this is about as far as I can stretch my fourth finger and fifth finger apart. And it doesn't feel great, and it's not that far. So if I take this distance, and then I turn my other hand into a one-eared llama, look at how much farther I can reach between five and four. And of course it's true in both hands. So the one-eared llama reminds us that we are three-dimensional creatures, and that we're going to sometimes need strange hand positions that are not just your typical one, two, three, four, five position, but that you can find the comfortable position that will let you get to where you need to go. So the idea of llama lets the hands close here. See, I bring my thumb towards the second finger. And when I go from here, in the left hand, to here, down to get to this pinky on the D, I'm not stretching for it. I'm letting this part of my hand close. Now you can, if you want to, decide that instead of having the thumb be part of the mouth of the llama, and of course, please don't be totally married to the idea of the animal llama, it's about letting your hands close for the shape, you might find that it's helpful to let your thumbs actually come up. That works too, but the main point is that you need to let part of the hand close if it has to. Once you've got your hands opening and closing, you can use 
repeated notes in the middle to be a pivot for a, a kind of anchor that gives you a sense of security about where the notes are. So here, the G in the right hand. So I can even just stay on that G and pivot over the other notes. I can do the same thing in the left hand with the B flat. That can be a useful way to practice. Whenever you have a single note in the left hand downbeat, make sure you take that moment to let the hand close and relax a little bit. Like here in measure five, measures four to five. I don't have to close all the way to a fist or even to a llama, but I don't want to have my thumb stretched out like I'm waiting to jump back up to the high part. Just take that tiny vacation to let the hand close a little bit. Let me show you that again. You might have noticed I didn't play the whole chord in the last beat of the left hand right before the single note. You can leave out the occasional note, especially in some of the four note chords. If you're feeling guilty about that, know that additions differ. In measures three and measure 35, which is the same, for example, Paderewski and the German first edition have a B flat at the bottom of the second right hand chord. So the second chord is this, and the third chord is this. But other editions, including Henley, take out the B flat and the second chord, so that the second chord is this, and the third chord is this. I actually like either to play both B flats or to take out the B flat and take out the next B flat so that it's. So the whole measure with both B flats sounds like this. And the whole measure without the C, without the B flats sounds like this. In measure 25, the left hand can leave out the last two middle Fs. In measure 27, I sometimes like to play just the melodic middle notes of the last two chords in the right hand. So I'm really playing only the middle notes, not anything else. You can also leave out the last F in the third finger in the left hand in that measure. So instead of doing this, you can just do. What I often do in performance is actually play the three against two in that triplet in the right hand so that I play the outside two both times, but I leave out the middle one so that I'm playing three with the middle voice while the outside is doing the duple. And that works nicely. So remember to rotate and keep your wrists and your elbows and your arms and your shoulders and your neck free as much as you can and sing, sing, sing. Enjoy Opus 10 number 11, and let me know if you have any questions. Good luck.